So, in case you haven't heard, Black Panther was nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. So let's talk about Black Panther. But first, let me address what I mean when I'm talking about objective criticism. Obviously, in some cases, the vast majority of critics and filmgoers can objectively agree that a particular film is superior to another. Oops, sorry, I put those in the wrong order. However, in any sort of art form, any objective analysis will still be influenced by a critic's objective opinion, even when the critic is trying to be as objective as possible. So, for example, a few years ago, Casey Affleck won Best Actor at the Academy Awards for his performance in Manchester by the Sea. Now, a friend of mine adored the performance and thought it was one of the best he had seen in recent years due to Affleck's restrained acting. I, on the other hand, thought it was a bit of a mixed bag, feeling that he was a bit too restrained at times, thus leading to a rather wooden performance. So here we have the two of us having conflicting opinions on a particular actor's performance, but we are still both trying to be as objective as possible. However, if I were to say Casey Affleck was previously in The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford, and that film also starred Brad Pitt, who mercilessly cheated on the love of my life Jennifer Aniston, and because of Affleck's association with Pitt, I feel his performance in Manchester by the Sea was bad, so you get the idea. In this case, I'm not even attempting to judge the film objectively, but rather allowing outside factors, besides my take on the merit of the performance, to influence me. So back to Black Panther. Now, there are many people who would disagree with me, but I would assert that Black Panther is objectively a pretty mediocre film. The film has some pretty noticeable plot and structure problems. The main theme of isolationism versus globalism is sort of wonky and not really fleshed out that well. And T'Challa, unfortunately, is regulated to a very passive character, especially compared to his appearance in Civil War, where, despite his limited screen time, he went through a complete and satisfying character arc. It's far from the best film Marvel has released, and hell, it wasn't even the best film they released this past year. Now, again, many may disagree and objectively believe that Black Panther Panther is best picture worthy, but we need to discuss the elephant in the room. Following the announcement of the Black Panther solo film, expectations were high to say the least, as it would be one of the first major superhero films featuring a black superhero. Now, of course, there were the likes of Blade and even Hancock before him, but this is the Marvel Universe we're talking about, so I totally agree it was a big deal. But due to Black Panther's status as one of the first major superhero films featuring a black hero, it was unsurprisingly hyper-politicized. Now, a film being hyper-politicized is far from a new thing, but over the last several years, the politicization of film has reached a new threshold, to the point where it's actually beginning to influence and warp film criticism as a craft. Recently, the film adaptation of the young teen novel The Hate You Give was released, which tells the story of a young black girl facing a conflict of identity, when a friend of hers, a young black man, is shot and killed by a police officer during a traffic stop, obviously a direct allusion to current events. Now, the film adaptation did pretty well, earning decent reviews. However, Panama Jackson, writing for for the Root, penned a review of the film which was quite critical, addressing how the film adaptation is void of some of the more complex nuances of the novel, making the film quite the watered-down experience. However, Jackson also writes, And yet, despite what I believe are reasonable critiques, I felt like, because of the film's content, I might not need to share them for the very reason. I didn't want to be a person who was poo-pooing black art that was meant to drive home a point or a purpose. Nobody wants to be the one to say black art doesn't do the culture good, especially when we don't get as many opportunities on that scale to tell our stories in this medium. Which, to an extent, I can at least partially understand. Studio executives care first and foremost about the bottom line, so a film performing badly can have lasting ripples throughout the industry regarding films dealing with similar subject matter. However, Jackson also notes, but it also feels disingenuous to intentionally not discuss something that explicitly intends to tell our stories and, more or less, stereotypically falls into tropism to do so. A sentiment I wholeheartedly agree with. Judging a film less harshly due to its subject matter is just as bad as being more critical of it. In either case, you are not treating the film as an equal. Now this is not to say that a film featuring themes that mirror current events should not be praised for doing so. Films like Network and Do the Right Thing directly address the social ills of the time, and in many ways are just as timely as they were in their respective years of release. However, these films portrayed and handled their subject matter with an immense amount of craft. The films are praised for their quality above all else, not simply because they tackled topical subject matter. But in the case of The Hey You Give, Jackson did not find the film to be very good, but was hesitant to give it an honest evaluation due to its subject matter in fear of, as he put it, being that guy when it comes to criticizing black art. Now let's apply Jackson's observations to the hype surrounding Black Panther. Following Black Panther's release, it held a 100% fresh rating on the popular film review site Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, RT, you are one complex and flawed animal in yourself. But that's a story for another time. Anyway, that 100% rating dropped to 99% following a negative review by Ed Power, writing for the Irish Independent. There was an immediate reaction criticizing the review and or reviewer directly, with some, unsurprisingly, tossing claims of racism. Above all else, this showed that the film had a highly defensive fan base, most likely due to the film's perceived cultural significance, which Ed Power even alludes to in his review. He writes, 14 months into the Trump presidency, Black Panther arrives on a storm clouds of hype, and with the presumption that, as the first African set Marvel movie, 
movie, it will deliver a resounding high kick to prejudice and decades of hierarchy, racial and otherwise, in blockbuster cinema. It is expected to stand for something bigger than itself. So here we have a larger example of the pressures that Jackson spoke of. A film being fiercely defended, not necessarily due to its merit, but because of its perceived political or cultural significance. But this is just a bunch of nobodies on the internet, right? It's not as if seasoned film critics would let their own subjective political opinions overtake their objective reading of a film, right? Well, if you think that, head over to RT and check out the reviews for Eli Roth's remake of Death Wish, starring Bruce Willis, which was also released this past year. The film is a remake of the 1970s Charles Bronson classic, where a man becomes a gun-toting vigilante following the murder of his wife and assault of his daughter. While the fan score indicates most enjoyed the film as a piece of entertaining campy pulp, critics pan the film, and upon closer inspection of the reviews, you will find many of them soaked with anti-gun rhetoric, making me skeptical if these particular critics even bothered to take an objective look at the film. It should be noted that the original Death Wish was also highly contentious at the time due to its debatable romanticism of vigilantism, but the criticism at the time was laced with nuance and deep analysis in what the film was trying to say in relation to the rising violent crime rates in the 1970s. Compare that to the criticism of the remake, which is mostly just... yeah, pretty much. And if you read the positive reviews of Black Panther, some hardly even speak about the film in any sort of objective way, with some even stating they don't find the film to be necessarily high quality, but still praise it due to its importance or significance. You'll find those words a lot in these reviews. And as a side note, pretty much all of what I just stated regarding Black Panther can also be applied to Crazy Rich Asians, another film from this past year that I thought was really good, but whose acclaim was overly augmented due to its perceived cultural ramifications. As I stated before, all film criticism, even when the critic is trying to be as objective as possible, still can't be wholly objective, as objective is a somewhat flexible term, as well as due to a critic's own subjective view of the piece. But now, due to the hyper of our entertainment world, we are in a time where I fear we are seeing some critics completely disregarding any sort of objective analysis in order to suit their own political and cultural viewpoints. Where certain films have the capability to be turned into full-blown culture wars, where having particular interest or disinterest in seeing a film can be equated to a political statement, where your like or dislike of a particular film can land you on either side of a battle you didn't even want to take part in. But so how does this all fit in with Black Panther being nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars? Surely the Academy voters wouldn't fold to this sort of political and cultural pressure and would seek to determine the best film objectively, right? <laughs> so it was recently announced that the Oscars are planning to have a hostless evening. As happy as I am to see the ceremony actually having a reasonable runtime for once, it got me wondering how the Oscars, usually looked to as one of the most prestigious and notable film award ceremonies, has divulged into an absolute controversy clusterfuck. Now that is not to say that in the 90 years since its debut, the Academy Awards ceremony has not dealt with its share of controversies and, um, other situations. Quite likely. But over the last decade or so, things have taken a turn for the worse. Last year alone, there were multiple controversies, what with the race relations and three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, Gary Oldman winning Best Actor despite his domestic abuse allegations, some blaming the Oscar voter demographics as to why Get Out didn't win Best Picture, which isn't totally baseless, mind you, and Emma Stone's cringy introduction of the Best Director nominees. These four men and Greta Gerwig created their own masterpieces this year. The year before that, there was Casey Affleck winning Best Actor despite his sexual assault allegations from 2011, Mel Gibson being nominated for his film Hacksaw Ridge despite his uh, alternative opinions regarding those of the Jewish faith, the whole hidden fences thing, host Jimmy Kimmel making fun of Mahershala Ali's name, and of course, while the accidental announcement that La La Land won Best Picture over Moonlight is what most people remember from that year, some may forget that leading up to the ceremony, these two films were pitted against each other in the most ridiculously overblown way. La La Land received glowing reviews following its limited release in the fall of 2016. But leading into the new year as award season was gaining steam, La La Land received criticism due to its lack of diversity. And so it began. These two films, two quality films that could not possibly be any more different, were thrust into political camps very quickly, and all of a sudden the brace for best picture was about more than just quality. It's about inclusion and who we are as a country, or fucking something, I don't know. Politics will, more often than not, influence voters. And while many award shows have the same problem, with the Golden Globes, Emmys, and Grammys all dealing with controversies regarding their lack of inclusiveness, this is especially true with the Oscars. Let me theorize as to why. The Oscars have been struggling to remain relevant over the last few years, with viewership steadily declining almost every year. 
with last year's ceremony seeing a 20% drop from the previous year's telecast, and no doubt the Oscars have noticed and tried to rectify this. Back in 2008, the ceremony garnered the lowest audience since 1974, and suffered a massive 25% decrease from the previous year's show. The following year, while ratings went up, there was backlash when The Dark Knight, one of the most acclaimed films of the year, was not nominated for Best Picture. This was attributed to what many have referred to as the Oscars genre bias. If you aren't familiar with the term Oscar bait, it is in reference to a very particular sort of film that the Academy tends to favor for awards recognition. Period pieces, costume dramas, characters facing institutional adversity, mostly serious dramas while certain genres, particularly action, sci-fi, and horror, just to name a few, rarely, if ever, win awards on the off chance they're even nominated. The fact that Toni Collette was not nominated for Best Actress this year for her performance in Hereditary is a crime against humanity. The Academy, fearing they were losing touch with their audience, opened the Best Picture pool from 5 to up to 10 nominees in an effort to attract a wider audience. Now, the Academy actually used to do this way back in the 1930s, with up to 12 films being nominated for Best Picture, but reduced it to only 5 nominees starting in 1945, though I am not certain as to the reason why. If anyone has any insight, please let me know in the comments. And this increase in Best Picture nominations seemed to work. The next year, viewership popped back up. Unfortunately, they were unable to sustain the influx of viewers over the coming years. The Oscars have made other attempts at increasing their viewership with a variety of hosts, even though the job has turned into one of the most trepid in Hollywood, and just this year announcing that they plan to eventually introduce a Best Popular Film category, a decree that caused collective cringe at such a ridiculously transparent attempt to garner a wider audience. And many, including myself, believing this award was specifically developed so Black Panther could win an Oscar, seeing as the superhero films, regardless of their quality, tend to also fall victim to genre bias. But again, so what? Controversies are rampant due to our current outrage culture, and the Oscars are just trying to keep their viewership up. So what's the connection between these two points? Well, the issue here is that, in their desperation, the Oscars have actually started bending to these controversies, despite the fact that they are, one, initiated by a small, obnoxiously loud minority, and two, based on faulty information or a lack of understanding about whatever it is they're talking about. I am sure many of you recall the Oscars So White debacle. In 2015, controversy brewed regarding the lack of racial diversity among the top category nominations for that year's ceremony. So here's sort of the problem with that whole debacle. The year that Oscars So White began, the only film featuring a predominantly black cast that had any sort of chance at the Oscars was Sama, a pretty mediocre film in my opinion, but I'd Many lambasted the omission of the film from both the Best Actor and Best Director categories, saying the racial demographics of the Academy was to blame. Or possibly, you know, maybe the fact that the film studio Paramount Pictures didn't send the film's screeners out in time to qualify for a number of other major film award ceremonies, most notably the Producers Guild of America, but yeah, let's just forget about that. The next year, the controversy was still in full swing, with celebrities and even President Obama weighing in. But hey, at least the Oscars had Chris Rock as host, right? Almost three weeks after the Oscars comes yet another apology from the Academy. This time it's over host Chris Rock's edgy joke that featured those three Asian kids who Rock joked were accountants. Uh, I can't get a over the next few years, efforts were made to make the Academy's voter pool more diverse, adding nearly a thousand new members just this past year. So here we have two big problems. Just because someone is a certain color doesn't mean they're going to automatically vote for movies featuring people of that same color. Even Jada Pinkett Smith, one of the biggest proponents of Oscar So White, called out Academy Representative Cheryl Boone Isaacs for insinuating this very thing. And number two, and I don't know if you guys know this or not, but if movies starring underrepresented groups don't get made, then they can't be nominated for awards. As I mentioned, the year the controversy started, only one predominantly black film was in contention, and there were other reasons for it not being nominated. So what the hell is the Academy supposed to do in this situation? Why are they getting the blame? If all these celebrities that harp on about lack of inclusion are truly upset about it, hit the studios, make something happen, fund your own production companies instead of just fussing about it. Why don't they do this? Well, there are two explanations. Either the people complaining about the problem are legitimately clueless as to its actual causes, or, and I feel this is sadly the more likely explanation, because in this day and age, generating and propagating controversy has its benefits outside of just being a troll, and finding a cheap scapegoat for a far more prevalent and complex problem in your industry is a great way to absolve yourself of any sort of responsibility. Hell, controversy can even be used to protect your film from criticism, however warranted it may be. Film didn't get good reviews? Blame the race and or gender of the critics. Criticized for being a blatant pandering to the social justice types? Blame misogyny. Your multi-million dollar franchise film was criticized for being subpar and not respecting the source material? Blame the, the Russians. 
uh, okay. So here we have the Oscars, a ceremony that is supposed to be about judging films based on their merit, now listening to these controversies to the point where it seems that the racial and or gender makeup of the nominees and winners is more important than whether or not they were nominated or won based on their artistic merit. The Oscars is supposed to be a competition, not some sort of equitable participation special. While some may say this is about equality and not equity, others are far more transparent about the nature of their misgivings. Last year, Greta Gerwig was not nominated for Best Director at the Golden Globes for her film Lady Bird. Now, I believe that Gerwig should have been nominated, but I also thought that the five nominees were all deserving as well. That didn't stop Natalie Portman from having to make a statement about it, not realizing that her virtue signaling moment came at the cost of downplaying the achievement of the actual nominees. But here is what's so sad about that whole situation. I thought Greta Gerwig should have been nominated because she deserved it. But if you read many articles after the snub, they were more upset about there being no female nominees. That was their main point of contention. Not that Greta was unjustly snubbed, but simply because it was five men being nominated. There were similar calls about Patty Jenkins not being nominated for Wonder Woman, which is just, like, fucking seriously? This same sort of controversy is happening this year in response to the lack of female nominees for Best Director. I would put money that half the people complaining there are no female director nominees have not even seen some or any of these female directed films and are only concentrating on the equity of the nominations rather than if any of these women's work was superior to the five men nominated. This sort of mentality is a double-edged sword. Later that year, Greta Gerwig was nominated for Best Director at the Oscars. So question, do you think the Academy voters gave Gerwig the nomination because they thought she deserved it, or they didn't want to deal with the colossal clusterfuck of criticism if they didn't? The truth? I have no idea. And that question will always remain, which is a true shame. It's also even more of a shame that Emma Stone's pathetic rehash of Natalie Portman's virtue signaling came at the cost of downplaying Jordan Peele's Oscar nomination in the same category despite the fact that there have only been five black people ever nominated for Best Director, and none of them have ever won, whereas Catherine Bigelow won for The Hurt Locker in 2010. Back in 2013, when 12 Years a Slave was up for several Oscars, host Ellen DeGeneres made this crack in her opening statement. Anything can happen. So many different possibilities. Possibility number one, 12 Years a Slave wins Best Picture. <laughs> Possibility number two, you're all racists. <laughs> A funny joke, but unfortunately one that had a sliver of truth to it. There is no denying that if 12 Years a Slave didn't win big at the Oscars, there would be calls of bias and racism toward the voting body. But when the film did win big, there were calls the film only won because the Oscars were trying to avoid such claims. And that theory isn't totally BS. We even see that happening right now regarding this year's nominees. This has been a pervasive problem. In 2017, there was a higher number of black nominees with three films in particular that were pretty serious contenders. This led May to decry that the Oscars were finally getting it or that they were trying to make up for the lack of diversity in the preceding years. But this is total bullcrap because these nominated films were in production way before Oscars So White even began. August Wilson is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning playwright. When we did Fences on Broadway, we had more nominations than any play in the history of American theater. We just happened to be here this year. Hmm. August Wilson is not here because of what someone tweeted or whatever texted a year ago. We just happened to be here this year because that's the way my schedule worked out. We were actually working on it for the last seven years. But the poisonous question remains, were these films nominated because of their merit or as some sort of move by the Oscars to try and fix the diversity problem? But hey, in either case, at least the Oscars got past the diversity issue, right? Well, no, seeing as while they had a higher number of black nominees that year, they were criticized for their lack of Asian and Latino representation. It creates an impression that any nomination of a film featuring a diverse cast is simply an effort for the Oscars to seem more inclusive. And now we have come to this year's Oscars and Black Panthers nomination. As I stated before, I don't think the film is worthy enough for a nomination, let alone a win, but there may be some who disagree with me. I have no problem with someone liking Black Panther. I do have a problem with anyone using the film, any film, as a pawn in their diversity agenda. Putting a film on a pedestal for any reason other than its own merit does a disservice to the film and its creators. You are not treating the film as an equal among its peers. And unfortunately, that is the beast I believe the Oscars is on its way to becoming. More focused on being inclusive and diverse rather than being a reputable and honorable competition that treats its nominees with respect. So what's the solution to fixing all this? I honestly have no idea. 
I honestly can't see controversy about diversity or representation ever being disconnected from the Oscars, or any other award show for that matter. Hell, even film criticism as a whole. I can only hope that the Oscars will stop worrying about or bending to these folk controversies and have enough respect for the art form to judge a film simply on its own merit. I hope that isn't too much to ask for. So, with the Oscars coming up soon, let's just hope they don't make any other dumb decisions until then. A host won't be the only thing missing from this year's Oscars. Several categories, including cinematography, won't be aired live. God damn it!